best of water kept here for you? Or, you sure? Okay. okay. Rest your pipes. We're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the Albany Institute of History and Art in Albany, New York. It is the 11th of February, 2005, at approximately uh, 1 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Frank J. Muth. Date of birth? Yes, sir. 8, 10, 23. And where? Philadelphia. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I went to the middle of my last year in high school, 12th grade. And I figured... You know, it was defense plant opened up and distance saw, and I was looking for some money. <laughs> so I went to work there. I had a cousin who was already working there, and they were paying good money. So I went to work there for a year. Now, what, what defense plant was this? What? This was uh, distance saw. Oh, okay. They were making armor plate. Uh -huh. Matter of fact, I went in the armor plate department, and we were straightening three-inch armor plate with 100-ton presses, hydraulic presses. Now, how old were you at this time? About 18 or so? Yes. Okay. And uh, I worked there for a year. And now, how then, much was good money? Well, in those days, it was about 150 bucks a week. That was good money. Yes. And uh, it was hard work. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you were done at the end of the day, you knew you put in the day's work. How long of a day did you put in? Well, usually just eight hours. But uh, I worked there for a year, and I figure my number's coming up, and I didn't want to get in the Army. I figured I didn't like climbing around in the mud. So a friend of mine in the neighborhood, we decided we'd go down and join the Navy. Well, at that time, the Navy had this deal two years or duration of the war. Now, I'll take that. <laughs> so we went in. But we went to different boot camps. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you enlist? Well, you must have the date there somewhere. Okay, yes, I do. 10-15-42. Uh, That's right. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to back step, go back a little bit. Do you remember where you were? and um, what your reaction was and how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, we were visiting my sister. We went there for dinner. Jean, I didn't know Jean then. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they were listening to the radio and it came over at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your reaction or your reaction to the family at all? Didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so did the family. And so wasn't anything I could do at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't rush down to get join up, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I put my name in and of course you got a number, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go in the army. And then I decided, well, I'm gonna join the Navy. Mm -hmm. Now where did you go for your basic training? Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is, we both signed up at the same time. Of course, it was just alphabetical. He went out to Chicago, and I went to Rhode Island for boot camp. And after boot camp, they sent me down to uh, Richmond, Virginia, the diesel school. Learned to take engines apart, put them back together. And it was all, of course, they knew what, why I was doing this, because of these, right? Because they had diesel engines in them. Okay, all, these are the landing crafts. That's right. Mm -hmm. And all auxiliary power on the ship was diesel engines for power in case anything happened, you got hit. So that's why. And after eight weeks at diesel school, we went, it was five of us, and we went up to Pier 92, New York, and waited there for about three days till they shipped us out to Brooklyn Navy Yard where the ship was in dry dock being worked on because it had already gone through an invasion of North Africa. 
and they want to put more things on to put boats on. The belt CVPs. And we were walking down the dock, and two of the guys looked up at the ship and said, No way, we're not going on that ship. And they turned around and took off. Of course, I went on with the other two. And the first job I got, they had pulled into New York in the winter. It was cold and the engine froze up, stripped idling gear. And they set me up on the boat deck, ripped the engine apart, take the idling gear out of the transmission and put a new one in. That was my first job. But uh, eventually went down to Little Solomon's in the Chesapeake Bay and picked up all our boats again. Now what was the ship that you were assigned to? The Elizabeth C. Stanton. Okay. It was an amphibious transport. It really belonged to the Mormac Star uh, Company. Mm -hmm. And it was called the Mormac Star. And uh, well, when the Navy took it over, they changed the name to Elizabeth C. Stanton, P-69. Amphibious transport, mm -hmm. which is C3 cargo ship, which they converted. And then we picked up the boats and we were training soldiers in landing down there on, on the beaches in the Chesapeake. Now, how many landing craft could you carry? We carried about 32 LCVPs and two what they call tank lighters. They were a little bit larger. You could put a half track in there for a, a pickup truck with a trailer on. They were slightly larger mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. And we had the control boat because eventually the captain became the Commodore of the 99th Amphibious Division and he stayed aboard our ship. And the exec became the captain. But then we went to the Mediterranean but after the invasion of Sicily, we came back to the States, and took troops, made two trips to England, to uh, Glasgow. So you acted as a troop carrier also? Yes, because you know, they were getting ready for the big one over there. So we went to Glasgow and Southampton, made two trips, and then back to the Mediterranean. And by then, the First Division had gone by Oran, and that became our own port in the Mediterranean. And we stayed there off and on and kept taking troops back and forth from the States. And then the invasion of Sicily. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that a little bit? Going into detail? Well, the night of the invasion, the Mediterranean, they had this, what they call a minstrel. It's a wind that comes up. There's a cloud in the sky. It just blows like crazy, and the water got so rough, and the poor guys in these LSTs and, and the destroyers, I mean, they were really whipping around. And we almost thought they might call off the invasion because it was so rough. And there's an article in the book that will even tell you about that. Uh, but they kept going, and after sunset, wind just died down, and they went on. And uh, well, during the invasion, I watched three German tanks come down on the beach that come through our lines, and a cruiser and a destroyer sailed right up at them and blew them apart. And then it was a big, uh, they call it a monitor, it looked like a battleship, but it wasn't near as big, but it had pretty big guns on it. And that was off maybe half a mile from us. And I'm standing there watching it, firing into the beaches. And they either hit a mine or it was a torpedo, I don't know which, but this big water spout come up from the side of it and uh, slowed it down. But I'm sure it was well armored, so they didn't sink it. And, uh, but it got so bad, why they picked that beach is beyond me. Because there was a sandbar before the main beach. And uh, 
lot of the boats never made it across the sandbar. And the poor guys who got off between, between the sandbar and the main beach were up to here in water, right? And they had to go ashore. Now they're the guys I always felt sorry for. Now they were under fire the whole time. Sure. Those guys that climbed down those, got in the boats and went ashore, they're real heroes. They may never have killed an enemy man, I don't know, but it was immaterial as far as I was concerned. I mean, my being there was just one of those things. I did my job, and so I'm no hero. Mm -hmm. But those guys, the way I look at it, they were all heroes. But that's how it goes. But after, like I said, we were losing so many uh, landing craft. Later on in the afternoon, they decided to send a work party ashore and uh, try to retrieve some of these boats, which I was in the landing party. I went ashore, and uh, there were an awful lot, as you can see here. That's why. See how that boat? These guys are really sailors there figuring out how to get these boats back off. Were you under fire at that point? Not really. Well, let me, I say not really, not at that particular time, but the boat I was on, the landing craft, when it hit the beach, I hear all, all these whistles blowing and sirens gone, and here the Army had 40 millimeters stationed all along, and they were watching for airplanes, dive bombers, because that's how that LST got hit. And we no sooner dropped our ramp and you could hear the plane coming up the beach. Well, I dove under the ramp. Now, what kind of equipment? Did you have a helmet and so on? Oh, a helmet, yeah. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody had a helmet. Did you have any sidearms? No, no guns. No guns at all? No, they didn't trust us with guns. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, they have to, and the dive bomber, they were trying to get this LST, and which they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we got off and worked on the boats, and I finally got one off, and it was dark already. And uh, I said to the chief, "What do you want me to do with it? Said, Take it out to the ship?" I said, "I can't see." And my hand in front of me, it's so dark. He wanted me to take it. He says, it's out there somewhere. <laughs> so sure enough. I now, you, this was, uh, what you're talking about, this LST right yes, here. Right. Now, that was a photograph taken by whom? Well, the, the shift photographer. Okay. The guy that took most of these pictures. Mm -hmm. here. And, uh, and this is showing the LST being hit. It, well, yes. Yes, here. Now, this was being hit by German aircraft. Yes. Okay. Dive bombers. Mm -hmm. And now that painting shows that ship being hit? That's right. Wayne, why don't you focus on that? Now this is an exhibit here at the Albany Institute of History and Art showing some paintings by combat painters. So that, you saw, did you see it as you get hit? Oh, yeah. Like I said, there was another LST on the side of that one, maybe 100 yards down the beach further. Mm -hmm. which was up really too. And we came in on the other side of that. And these dive bombers came out the beach. Of course, the army was shooting at the governors. Like I said, I dove underneath the ramp to make sure for that we should never go in too. Well, they got that at us too. Like I said, I got this boat off. She said, take it out to the ship. So I started out, and uh, it was near daylight. And finally, it was light enough to see, and I could see the ship way off in the distance. But then I start smelling chlorine gas. Oh, and I felt I'm standing in water. Well, what's wrong? <laughs> so we got alongside the ship, and they put the Davids down and we hooked them onto the rings. They couldn't pick it up because there was so much water in the boat. Why? Well, the only way they could lift it up, I dropped the ramp and let all the water go out. And they picked it up and here 
It was a good sized hole in the side of it from banging against other boats on the beach. It must have put a hole in it. And all the time we were riding out to the ship, the water was running in, right? And it got into the battery. And that's why it smelled chlorine gas when the salt got in the acid in the battery. But they got it up. And they said, you can go to bed. <laughs> we, were, we were up a day and a half already. So there are things you see and do. And you see this picture here. That was guys who didn't mind their P's and Q's. They had signs all over, don't walk on the beach. And the reason, as you'll see, there should be another picture there of all the landmines. There. And these two guys were shipfitters and they want to try to get souvenirs, right? So they went down the beach and stepped on a landmine and killed them. And that's who is being buried there or taken off. Well, after that, of course, we went back to Oran, which was kind of our home port in North Africa. We brought more troops over from North Africa. By then, North Africa was pretty well secured. And uh, then we came back to the States and picked up more troops, took them back to Oran. And uh, once we got we crossed into the boot of Africa, I mean into Italy, I'll go straight yet, Italy, and they start working up, and then it was time for another invasion, with Salerno, and uh, on our way to the invasion that afternoon, they said the Italians had capitulated, and they were going to so we thought, oh, it was going to be a picnic. Mm -hmm. Well, Salerno was a very bad invasion. Mm -hmm. And this is what, one of the pictures of them shooting at the flares. It was just after sunset. The Germans came over and dropped these flares and lit up the whole convoy going to the invasion. And uh, they were dropping bombs. And I remember being on the boat deck with my uh, GQ station, was an auxiliary uh, electric generator. In case anything happened in the engine room, they at least would have power to the bridge. Well, I stuck my head out through the hatch and looked at what was going on, and I see these bombs dropping, coming, coming. I thought, oh, the next one's us. Well, they either ran out of bombs or it dropped on the other side of us. <laughs> That's one time I thought, boy, we were lucky. And, uh, but Salerno was a pretty bad invasion. Now, on these landings, did you lose a large number of landing crafts at all? Or? Not so many there. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, like I said, the only reason we lost so many in uh, Sicily is because of the beach, sandbar. beach sandbars. Uh, of course, there were some shot up, I'm sure, but uh, it wasn't that bad. Now, when do you think that painting was, was done? Do you think that was done in the Mediterranean? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, this now is it the says it was on the, on the fan tail and where we usually hung out, played cards, and... No, we're about to you. I'm the one on the far well, right thing. Oh, with his hat back? Yes, yes. right. So if you look, you see how I wore my hair. <laughs> now, how did you uh, discover that this painting was here? I'm the only party. You are, okay. Uh, how did you discover that this painting was here? Well, it was on the paper, the Times Union. Uh -huh. The Thursday would have been better to stay. This was the previous Sunday. And I'm reading the 
arts and travel section, whatever it is, and there was this big article about the exhibit here. And I started to read it, but I looked down, there were three pictures, as I recall, two and then one. The bottom one was this one. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I recognized my husband. I didn't. But I read the caption underneath it, which said, mm -hmm. uh, on the fan tail of the Lizzie Stamp. Now, I've been hearing about the Lizzie Stamp since I got married, 57 years now. And so I threw the paper over to him, and I said, you better read this. But he did every mm -hmm. single word of it. But what was so very funny, he made no comment that day. That was Sunday. Tuesday, all of a sudden, out of the group, he says to me, we're going, aren't we? And I knew just what he meant. <laughs> and I said, absolutely. But so, when you see that picture, mm -hmm. you can do that. Oh, do you want to hold that up? And yes. you were able to, you could identify two of the other fellows. Didn't you do that? You yeah. Know? Do you want to stand up and point them out? Don't ask me their names. <laughs> <laughs> this fellow here. Yeah, he lived right across the river from Philadelphia. And uh, I remember him. I kept in touch with him for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And this fellow here. No, this is but I can show you their pictures in the book. When, when you were off duty, this is where you usually went for yeah. entertainment or, or the fan tail? Um, well... I, I have a box at home that probably has a hundred pictures in it, which I took. And we had all kinds of things going on on the fan too. You know, guys were practically naked most of the time, sunbathing mm -hmm. to get some sun. And uh, we hung out there and shoot the baloney. But uh, yes, there wasn't many places to go aboard ship. And, Right. And I spent most of my time in the engine room, so it was nice to get outside. Mm -hmm. Did you have movies on board ship, too? Uh, not too often. Uh -huh. We had them once in a while. But they had these groups that came, well, they were mostly French girls and fellas, you know, and they would sing and dance and all sorts. Like, like when we were in North Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And we went to Algiers. That's where. Yeah, yeah. Could you ever get to see any USO shows? Well, those... That well, beside they, those, no, uh, not really. any big name entertainers? Or? No. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so uh, after the invasion at Salerno, where did you go from there? Well, we came back to the States again, picking up more troops. Now, when you picked up the troops, did you also keep all the landing craft? Oh, yes, they were the ship too. Would. Because, how, many, how many troops were you able to carry? Well, we carried over 4,000 troops. Because it was a big ship. Mm -hmm. And they had converted all the cargo holds to troop carrying. And they had stanchions with these chain held uh, bunks. Mm -hmm. And they were eight high, believe me. And when we went through the North Atlantic, you didn't want to be on the bottom because most of the guys got sick. It was pretty rough. I mean, going across the North Atlantic in the wintertime, mm -hmm. I can remember standing up on the boat deck looking forward at the ship in front of us. And when that thing went into the waves, the screw would come out of the water. You could see, the, mm -hmm. you could see right down underneath the ship. And that was happening to us too. And then when that thing started going back up again and the screw hit the water, it made the whole ship shake. Yeah. It was rough. And then you had to change course every five minutes. They deviated so many degrees mm -hmm. because of the submarines. And Were you ever in a convoy that was attacked by submarines? Oh, yes. And if you're near the below water line, it's like if somebody took a sledgehammer and hit the side of the ship if a discharge goes off any distance because that travels through yes. uh, the water. Mm -hmm. I never saw some, but I knew they were chasing them, the destroyers, and you could hear it. But whether they ever caught one, of course they never told us. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Now, how long were you in the uh, Mediterranean and North Atlantic? Well, for at least two years. Mm -hmm. And then, well, we were back in the States and before the big invasion, D-Day, and I always say, yeah, well, they learned everything they needed to know for D-Day because we already had made three invasions, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, we were in dry dock, but they still had the boilers going, and they had water coming from the dock, and the guy fell asleep and blew the tubes on the boiler. So we couldn't leave with the rest of the convoy, which was going back to Europe. So it was almost a month before they got it repaired and all. And by then, I guess they figured, well, we don't need them over there. So we went to the Pacific. I spent a year in the Pacific. And I, all the islands you ever read about that you know, were invaded by us and taken back from the Japanese. We must have gone and visited just about every one of them, too. Mm -hmm. Moving troops around, getting them closer to Japan. And I finally got to Okinawa before, while I was in the Philippines. And there's pictures of those. And uh, finally got to Okinawa before it was completely taken. And we had two kamikaze raids while we were there. Now, they never left you shut the engines down. They always had to be underway because of that reason. And being an amphibious transport, we never really needed a dock. Everything that had to get unloaded or loaded, we just used our boats. So that was one thing we didn't have to tie up anywhere. Now, you, were you near Okinawa or off Okinawa when the typhoon, the big typhoon struck? No, I wasn't near there, but we were, uh, going from uh, Manila, we were going up to one of the islands. I forget which one it was when that typhoon struck. It was rough. Mm -hmm. yeah. But like I say, you know, it only lasts for so long. But if you go across the North Atlantic, January, February, it's like being a typhoon the whole way over. Mm -hmm. It's a week of traveling in really rough weather. So you think crossing the North Atlantic was, was oh. worse than a typhoon <laughs> yes. in the Pacific? Yes. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they're bad. And if you're on a small... What always astounded me is how they ever survived on those LSTs in those things. And they lost a lot of LSTs mm -hmm. that way. And even destroyers, they could turn over pretty easy too. Because if they got broadside to big waves, they... Th it looked like the stack was hitting the water when they went like this. <laughs> How those guys survived. Hmm. Now you ended up uh, going to Japan? Yes. Well, we were the first convoy to go in Seisebo, Japan. I was on the China seaside. And, uh, Let me ask you, uh, before that, if you don't mind, do you know where you were? for two events, the death of President Roosevelt. Do you recall that at all? Mm. Or at least your reaction to it? I don't think they really made a big thing of it uh -huh. at the time. Okay. Because that had to be around the time of Okinawa, uh -huh. if I recall, yeah. or going to it anyway. They mentioned it, but I mean, I thought he was a great man myself. Mm -hmm. but, How about the dropping of the atomic bombs? Well, you know, everybody says that was an awful thing. But I figure this way. When you figure how many people died through the Second World War, that was really a drop in a bucket. And if it really shortened the war, which I certainly think it did. I think it was a good thing, except nowadays, mm -hmm. what are you going to do about it? Yeah, yeah. But if we hadn't discovered it or developed it, someone else would have, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's better in our hands now when you think about it. Mm -hmm.
Okay, when you uh, reached Japan, could you tell us about that? Did you ever go ashore? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if you look at some of these pictures, let's see. Let me show you. Now, when do you remember when you reached Japan at all? Approximately? Time-wise. <laughs> well, that's okay. For you. It would have to be uh, probably September, October of 45. Right, right, right. Because, uh, like I say, we moved troops then up into Japan. And uh, Yokohama is the port, really. Mm -hmm. But we took a train from there and into uh, Tokyo. And uh, I did a little exploring in Tokyo. And I have pictures to show you. But there's the Philippines, what the Japanese did to the Philippines, when you think about it. There isn't a church that wasn't destroyed in the Philippines. And when you think about it, there was no reason for them to have to do that. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. They were fanatic when they came to those kind of things. And so they got their just due, I think, in the end. Of course, who am I to be sure. a judge of that? How did you find, did you have any encounters with the Japanese people? How were you? Not much. Because, first of all, couldn't speak Japanese. Mm -hmm. and. They pretty much stayed away from us. They didn't uh, mix too well. And, uh, and I wasn't in a mood to be friendly in that way. Uh -huh. Not that I would, you know. How long were you on, in Japan? Well, I made a couple of trips to Japan. We, like when the war was ended, we started bringing troops back to the States. We made two trips. And uh, so by the time Christmas came of 45, I had enough points to get out. And when we got to the States just before New Year's, I got off the ship. Now, I could have gotten out then and there as far as my points were concerned, but we had to lay around for a week to get transportation east uh -huh, uh -huh. to get to Bainbridge, Maryland, where I was discharged. So. You know, it's astounding. Here's an astounding picture. There's a church. Now look at that wall. It's the only wall standing. Now this is in the Philippines? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's Manila. Now uh, you were discharged in 1946? Yes. Did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Well, 5220. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. Well, uh, why not? Until, I mean, I guess it was maybe two months I was on that, and I was bumming around. I go, out of hell, they owe me. <laughs> not that it was a great pay, fifty-two twenty, right? But uh, after two months, my old man came to me. He said, "Be down at brewery on Monday. I got a job for you." So I was C. Schmitten's son of Philadelphia Brewing Company. And so I went to the brewery and I became an apprentice for two years, which you never hear much about anymore, apprenticeships. But you learn to run every piece of equipment in the brewery, which I did. And I stayed there for 37 years. I guess the apprenticeship worked out well. Huh? Yes. So were you a brewmaster? Assistant, eventually. Well, so I, I was in the union for about 25 years, mm -hmm. and so I got a pension from them because 20 years 
in the union pension. And then I went into management for the rest of the time. Uh -huh. And I got a pension from that. Now, you never used the GI Bill outside of the 5220 Club? No. Did you join any veterans organizations after no. you left? None? I had it. <laughs> Do you stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? I did for a while. Uh, one of the fellows, Panessa, he was from uh, Niagara Falls, and he was Italian. We used to go to Mont Livia a lot together because he could speak, you know, Italian. And he was, this old man was a stonemason. He made tombstones. <laughs> but, yeah, we, we'd visit him, and he came to see us. And like I said, one fellow lived right across the river from us. And we were, I forget what the name of that town was. We saw him a couple of times. But I never stayed in touch with the fellows. How do you think your time in service had changed or had an effect on your life? Well, I think my life was pretty well set by the time I went to service. Let's, that sounds crazy, but how many kids do you know of today that don't get a, an allowance, right? I never got an allowance. I served a hundred bullet papers every day after work. And anything I had to buy, I started doing photography. When I was about 11 years old, I did all my own developing and everything. Everything I had ever bought, I earned myself and paid for it. So, and in the summertime, I cut lawns, did garden work mm -hmm. to make money. Now, how were you able to get a camera and, and take all these pictures of them? <laughs> oh, no, that's, that wasn't that camera. No. Uh, the first camera I had in the Mediterranean was, remember the old uh, Kodak box cameras, mm -hmm. right? That's what I had, one of those pin cameras. That was the first one. That was hard to hide. It was too big. It was too big. But then in the, later on, I bought this 35 millimeter <clears throat> Univex Mercury. <clears throat> but it wouldn't hold a cartridge. And so I had to go in a dark room, take the film out of the cartridge, roll it on a spool, put it in that camera. It was one of the first decent 35 millimeter camera. I paid about $35 for it at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it only took half frames, not whole ones. Mm -hmm. So on a 36 exposure roll, I could get 70 some. 72. Yeah. And if the doctor wasn't available, we'd been up to the bed trust. <laughs> <laughs> now how did you do, did you send this film home to be developed or how did you no. develop it? The fellow in that book there, a pharmacist mate, he did it in the pharmacy. As a matter of fact, one of the last uh, roles I gave him to develop, he came to me after he had developed it. As a matter of fact, those pictures are in here. And he says, uh, I'll give you $35 for each one of those negatives. He wanted to keep them. I didn't know they were doing this. Oh, right? They probably wound up in there. I said, well, if they're worth $35 to you, he never told me about the book. I said, I think I'll just keep them. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, did you, oh, I know. How about this, uh, could you tell us where, approximately, where and when that was taken, if you recall? Well, that was on the fan tail of the ship again, right? <laughs> you got that? Okay. How old were you there? Uh, probably 20 at the time. But you see, I don't know if you ever heard of air bedding. Now, every ship, twice a week, you had to air bedding. And you got a mattress, right? And you had to take that out on deck and hang it over the railings to air it out. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, 
here's a picture of a cruiser. Oh, Japan. You want to see Japan? There. These are some of the photographs you took in Japan? Yes. Now this is with your 35 millimeter yeah. by this time? Well, they didn't care by then. Right, right, yes. And so I took a lot of pictures. Matter of fact, when we finally got back to San Francisco, I had about 150 negatives. And so I went to the fellows. I took a lot of the guys, you know, board ship. Here's Japan. Now you said something about the... Airing the, the bedding. Airing the bedding. There was a cruiser. Yeah. But you'll see it. Yeah. Which one? This one down here. Here are the mattresses being aired along the oh, okay. along the deck. Okay. But we got back to Frisco. I had all these negatives, and a lot of the guys aboard ship. So I went and asked guys, anybody wants these pictures, whatever it costs to print them, that's all it would cost you. So it wound up about 72 pictures, and each one paid me whatever it cost to have them printed. Well, some of those came out about this big because photographic paper mm -hmm. was hard to get by then, you know, at the end of the war. And so to, to print, it was about 10 of them. 10 guys wanted all these pictures. <laughs> So by the time they printed all these things, they didn't have much paper left. <laughs> Could you tell us about this photograph? Well, that's that's looking at the moat that goes around the cap of the uh, royal palace in Japan in Tokyo, and that's the bridge that goes across the moat. Okay. You, you, if you just hold it back, he can focus in. Okay. And there's this last one. Well, this is in the, the Philippines. Now, who's that with you? Mm. Huh. Well, he, shipmate. Yeah, he, he was really a deckhand. I mean, it wasn't one of the guys I usually hung out with, okay. but we just happened to be ashore on Liberty, and I was walking around. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for the interview. You're welcome.